tonight. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. I know there'll be some that come in a little bit later. And uh, we're going to redeem the time in our service tonight. If you're able, we'll ask for to stand with us. Let's invite the presence of the Lord into our midst. Father, we are grateful to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. This is the day that you've made. We come to worship you. We come to lift praise and to magnify your name. You're worthy of all of our praise tonight. God, we ask you that you'll just look upon every need in this house. Oh God, that you'll meet them all through Christ by his riches. Lord, let all we say and do bring you glory and honor and praise as do your name. I pray, oh God, you would just open up the heavens tonight and pour out your spirit upon us in this house. I ask you, Lord, that you'll anoint the preached word your business in a powerful way as we seek your face tonight around this altar. Do it all we ask in Jesus' mighty name.
seen page 269, our hymn book tonight, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
I'm looking for Jesus to come. One day it's going to be more than a hope, a dream, a song, a prayer. It's going to be a reality. And when it is, I'm going to be out of here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You can be seated. We're going to ask our ushers tonight if they'll come. Brother Butch, you'll help us. Oh, you want to help me with that? Thank you, Lord. We're going to worship the Lord with our giving tonight. All of our offerings this week is going to our evangelist. We appreciate him, his ministry, his life, and he's going to be a blessing to us this week. Amen. Let's give tonight as unto the Lord. We want to be a blessing to him. Amen. And to his family. Appreciate Sister Rose coming with him. She's not long off of surgery, so I know it's a little bit of a sacrifice for her to be here. And so definitely we want to be a blessing to them. And I ask Brother Butch, he would ask the Lord to bless the offering tonight.
is to tonight. We've got three ball that's with us tonight. Had one last night. He's in good hand, Brother Larry. Brother Larry, stand testify tonight. Say something to the Lord. Testimonies don't ever get old, bro. Amen. Appreciate Brother Roscoe driving all the way over to be in revival with us in Panama City. Brother Stan, Stan, say a word for the Lord tonight. Let's love this preacher tonight as he comes. Let's let him know we're glad to have him at Bible West City. I'm going to do something tonight a lot of 60-something year olds don't do. I'm about to use a tablet. A friend of mine, young friend of mine, was preaching in the church, and uh, he uses a tablet for the most part. There was a storm and the power went out. He was glad he had an iPad. Uh, my, my thing is, uh, you know, I, I just, I came along at an age when light bulbs blew, and fuses blew, and I just don't trust iPads to stay on, even if it does has 90, have 99% charge. <laughs> but I've got a hard copy back there, and just in case this don't work, I'll fall back on that. So good to have all of you in the house of the Lord, Brother, Brother Larry, these sisters that are here, I forgot to recognize her last night. I think Brother Eddie may have. Uh, but so good to have you. Whatever investments you've made to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I appreciate the fact that you're here. I appreciate the singers and the singing. Uh, the Lord is, is good. You know, I was thinking about it at one time. If, if we didn't have singing before the preaching. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Some churches especially, you, you need some singing before the preacher gets up. <laughs> I've been a few of them too. Uh, but just so good to have the, the singing and the music. Brother Clendenin said this. He said the singing 
gets people, you know, ready for the Word of God. And he said, he gives the late folks a chance to get there. <laughs> Thank God for, for singing that, that ushers our minds uh, into the presence of the Lord, brings his presence into the church. Uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, turn there with me, please, for the reading. The word of the Lord, I'll read Genesis 3, 1 through 5. And then chapter 19, the book of the Revelation, I'll read verse 20. Uh, not many verses there, but I'll share with you uh, for the next little while what's on my heart. Uh, tonight, don't know how much we'll shout, uh, but you know, I, I don't hold the governor on that anyway. Uh, you, and and uh, uh, there is something before I left home last uh, last week, just it just dropped out of my spirit. And as a matter of fact, it's been some time since I preached it, and, and I was praying, asking God, do you know, what, what do you want me to say when I get the Bible away? And this message just dropped into my spirit. I'd gone to bed uh, Sunday night, and, and it dawned on me. That you never found that sermon, and you didn't email it to yourself. So I had to do that in the night. Uh, so that I, I could have, because I couldn't, get, I couldn't rest. It, it just wouldn't let me alone. And so, uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight, I believe the Lord dropped it into my spirit before I ever left home. And if you go with me for the next little while, I'd like to share it with you. Book of Genesis, chapter three, Revelation, chapter nineteen. If you'd be kind enough to stand with me, if you're not infirm in your body, you're able to do that. Uh, I can read pretty fast, and you won't have to stand very long. Uh, Genesis three, one through five. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said. I want you to notice that. Yeah, hath God said. First question in the Bible was asked by the devil. Well, the serpent, and I believe inspired by the devil. He said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but... Of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Notice this, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Revelation 19, verse 20. The Bible says, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received, notice this, the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. For the next little while, I want to preach to you on this thought simply, the mark of the beast. I'm sure you'd probably say, Brother Jones, how do you reconcile Genesis with Revelation? Well, if you'll give me about two hours, I think I can tell you. <laughs> Man, please don't mind it. Help us preach. You might be seated. Sit down, please. Don't sit down on me. Help me the next little while. If you will, please. Again, the title of my message is simply The Mark of the Beast. Uh, make no mistake about it. Tonight, saints of God, it matters what God said. It matters what God says. It matters what he is saying. But when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the written word of God, it matters what God said. The Bible is not the book of the day, nor is it the book of the week or the book of the month or the book of the year. It is the book of the ages. And it matters what God said. Great many people across denominational lines in, in the hour we're living right now no longer believe the Bible to be verbally inspired by God. As a matter of fact, one, one constant mantra that you'll hear in this modern hour is, well, the Bible was written by man. And I want to say, duh, who do you think wrote it? Who wrote the Koran? Who wrote the Mormon Bible? Man wrote it, but God inspired it. You ever heard such a lame uh, defense for, for not believing the Bible? Well, man wrote it. Well, y'all we shout tomorrow. Let me move on here. Uh, millennials are driving a, a great many things today. As a matter of fact, uh, they are. Millennials are becoming more uh, atheist 
uh, in great numbers and uh, at an alarming rate, more of them. Uh, now, there is, I understand, the move of God among, among some of them, uh, maybe Gen Xers and, and Gen Zers, but uh, the, the millennials, if they ever realize the power that they have, they are driving things to the point. Uh, that there's some things not even being sold anymore uh, because millennials don't use them. It doesn't matter that you and I do, but the fact that millennials are not using them, uh, they're not been packaged, they're not been sold. Uh, some years ago, there was an attempt, I understand, uh, to, quote, jazz up the Bible. Jazz up the Bible. Uh, yeah, and, and it was said that, that people need to know that the Bible is cool. Uh, well, I, I agree with one preacher who said uh, that people need to know that the Bible is true, whether they ever believe that is cool or not. There are going to be more people. Uh, this, is, this is my opinion now. Uh, there's going to be fewer people rather in heaven uh, than in hell who believe that the Bible is, is cool. People are not going to go to heaven because they believe the Bible is cool. They're going to go to heaven because they believe it's true. And they anchor their soul, they anchor everything in the fact that that book is true. Uh, that's part of the reason people say, well, it's written by man. They're trying to say uh, that the Bible is not true. Well, uh, you know, we, we first heard it from, from the Bible. We first heard it, uh, but there's more talk now. There's more chatter now about the mark of the beast uh, than, than, than all the 2,000 years leading up to now. Men are talking more about that uh, than ever before. Understandably, uh, there is a debate over what uh, the mark of the beast really is. I didn't come to Night to talk about what it is because I don't know that is the mark of the beast in the book of the Revelation. I, I don't know what that is. I don't care what that is. I plan on getting out of here. I'm going to let the crowd worry about that that needs to worry about that. Uh, but you know, I didn't come tonight to explain uh, what the mark of the beast is. There are theories galore and uh, misconceptions abound. Brother Clendenin made this statement one time. He said some of our forefathers would not join a church. Uh, he said they wouldn't do that because they thought that it was the mark of the beast. But then he quickly said, but no beast could mark it. I wonder if that could be said in the modern hour. That no beast can mark us. Uh, well, no generation has ever been more ready for the mark of the beast than this generation. No generation has ever been more ready prophetically. None has ever been more ready uh, technologically. None has ever been more ready and willing uh, for the mark of the beast than the generation you and I currently occupy, at least the time span. Uh, this is the most marked generation of all time. This is the time of, and, and, and please don't get offended, just, just let me say it because you're not the first to hear it, uh, but uh, this is the time of the tattoo. Tattoos are no longer relegated to prisoners and bikers and gangs and savages. Uh, you know, we, we're living in a time when some grandmas have as much ink on them as their granddaughters do. Uh, you know, they, 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 that's just a fact. Uh, the people who most want to know what was the mark of Cain, uh, the, the people who most want to know that, are many of them are more marked up than Cain was. And I don't know what his mark was, uh, but you know, they're, they're more marked up than Cain, uh, and they are, they are more ready for the mark of the beast than anybody around. Now, while it is true, uh, that a mark of the beast is coming in the not too distant future. It is not the first mark of the beast. If you'll give me a little latitude here. Uh, it's not the first mark of the beast. It's not the only mark of the beast. It will be his last mark. Uh, but there's already been one mark of the beast around for at least 6,000 6, years. The most dangerous mark of the beast is not the one in revelation. It is the one in the book of Genesis. I want to introduce it to you tonight. His last mark, the last mark of the beast may be his most prominent mark. That last mark may be the most mysterious mark, but it is not the most deadly mark. A lot of folks going to die uh, that don't take that mark if there are a lot of folks that don't take it. The last mark will not affect nearly as many people as the first mark has 
already affected. The last mark will not be around for nearly as long as the first mark has already been around. And you can forget ink. I'm not talking about that. Long before Adam could read or write, if he could do either one of them, long before the invention of parchment and paper and ink and, and quill and hieroglyphics and punctuation marks and diacritical markings, long before all of that, uh, the beast had his first mark ready. The beast, I'm talking about the devil now. He had his first mark ready. There is no biblical record of which I'm aware. I do know he was extremely extremely intelligent, uh, but I don't know that Adam could read or write. Maybe he could do both. I'm just telling you, I can't prove that he could read or write. I do know this. I, I wonder why didn't Adam write the book of Genesis? Why, why didn't he write the book of Genesis unto Adam? God never said these things right. Didn't do that until uh, Moses. Moses wrote the book. Uh, God did say to Adam, he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, keep the garden, uh, freely eat, have dominion, things like that. But he never told Adam to write down anything. Maybe he couldn't read. Maybe he couldn't write. In the case of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if Adam could not read, if he could not write, he did not need letters. He did not need a caution sign. He did not need a skull and crossbones. He didn't need any of that to stay away from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For 300 years, depending on who uh, you believe, but uh, 120 to 300 years, all that kept him and Eve away Away from that tree was the spoken word of God. God said, you'll not eat of that tree. Uh, the day you do, that day, you're going to die. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Uh, God just simply said, don't do it. And for 120 to 300 years, depending on what you believe, they just stayed away uh, from, the, he didn't have to read uh, to, to, to stay away from the tree. God just said, don't do it. And they stayed away. Uh, well, you know, God alone could have done and that, uh, and that first couple, uh, that fruit was forbidden them. They could tend the garden. They could tend that tree, but they could not eat of the fruit. The original Hebrew and Greek scriptures, you understand, had no punctuation marks. You open that black back Bible you got or open that tablet, that phone, and, and you'll see punctuation marks all in that. Uh, well, when God first gave the scriptures, when God just first gave uh, the word of God, the original Hebrew and Greek had no, had no punctuation marks. I called a, a Greek scholar, a friend of mine, uh, who, who taught for years in a, uh, in a college, and, and I asked him about that. He said, no, there, there, were no, there was no punctuation marks when uh, the, the scriptures were, were first given. Allegedly, a reading was not enjoyed uh, by monks uh, uh, in the early 19th century or in the 19th century before that, as a matter of fact. So the need for punctuation uh, became important. You might say, Brother Jones, that's mundane. Hang on a minute. There, there was no punctuation given. Uh, so in time, punctuation was added in the Bible uh, by men. It was years after uh, the writing of the Word of God. Understand, punctuation is not divinely inspired, but that doesn't make it wrong. There might be places men put a comma in the wrong place. I don't know. That does not make the scriptures wrong, nor does it make uh, your punctuation wrong. Punctuation became standardized in the 19th century, that is, in the 1800s. The question mark uh, was introduced in the 8th century by Alquin of York. He invited Charlemagne uh, the Great to join his court, and uh, he is known, Alquin of York is known as the father of the question mark. Now, the question mark was born in the Garden of Eden, even though Alquin of York is known as the father of the question mark. I submit to you tonight in the fear of God that the question mark is the first mark of the beast. Shout to Mar, just let me preach to you. 
I believe that the question mark is the first mark of the beast. Long before Adam knew, if he ever knew what a question mark was, and allegedly he didn't. Long before he knew what a question mark was, he was marked by one. Before man is ever marked by the beast in the Revelation, Adam was marked by the beast in the book of Genesis. The same beast let loose around the globe in the book of the Revelation is the, is the beast let loose or, or loose in the garden uh, in Genesis the last mark to come the one that is ahead the last mark to come will go in the hide in the head or the hand the first mark went into the heart and I submit to you if the beast mark your heart, he will mark your hide. Shout with me somebody. I said if the beast can mark your heart he will mark your hide. Now how and where did all of this begin? It started I've already alluded to it. It started in the Garden of Eden. The hard Garden of Eden was a place of grand design and a grand and divine design a conceived in the mind of God created by the hand of God. It was the most beautiful place on, on planet earth. There was nothing to hurt or harm or injure or destroy anywhere uh, that man placed his foot. Sin was unknown. It was unthought of. It was unheard of. Pain was a mystery having never been experienced by man. Clothes were not necessary. Absolutely unimportant. And Adam never built a house. He didn't have to make a fashion statement. Nobody but him and Eve. Well, the dog didn't chase the cat, and the cat didn't chase the rat, and the rat didn't hunt cheese, and the lion didn't eat the lamb, and the adder was not ill-tempered. It was into this paradise that God placed his prized creation, which was man. The devil couldn't kick the door in. He couldn't break it in. Her. Uh, that serpent did come and go, apparently. Uh, but for 120 to 300 years, man was content with nothing more, nothing less than the word of God. Somebody shout with me in this house. Uh, the, the beast, though, the beast came into that garden uh, and he slipped that first mark uh, into that garden by way of the serpent. The first recorded words or, or the first question in the Bible was asked by that serpent, inspired by the devil. Yeah, hath God said. Eve had no struggle believing God. She had no struggle with the word of God until the devil planted a little bit of doubt in her mind and in her heart. Hath God said, you shall not eat of this tree. She said, God said, we can't eat of it. We can't even touch it unless we die. And this is what the devil said. He, you, you know, he's got a reeling now. She's on the ropes. He asked that question. And all of a sudden, she's second guessing everything Adam told her and everything. Everything God had said, she's second guessing it all. Uh, he, he saw that she's on the ropes, and immediately he said, You shall not surely die. You're not going to die because God doth know. Isn't that just like the devil? Uh, the, 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 he, he, listen, he didn't bring another man. What wasn't another man. He, he didn't bring country music, rock music, rap music. Uh, none of that. It wasn't disco. It wasn't a strip club. Uh, it wasn't a, 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 a dirty magazine. No. The way he got in was by planning doubt in her mind. And all he did was he asked a question. He marked her with the first mark of the beast. I'm telling you, folks, we live long enough in our day that there are people that started out right. They started out strong. And now they're second guessing everything about that book. They're second guessing everything about God, about the nature of God, about the love of God, the reason Jesus went to Calvary. I'm telling you tonight, saints of the living God, if the devil can mark your heart, it'll be easy for him to mark your heart. If you started out strong, you ought to finish strong. Jude said, uh, it, was, it was necessary that I write unto you that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Don't let him, I don't care what Bible comes along, don't let anything change your faith. Don't let anything shake your faith in God if you started out believing in 
the virgin birth, you keep on believing in the virgin birth. If you started out believing that the Bible was verbally inspired, you keep on believing that the Bible is verbally inspired. If you started out believing that hell is hot and unsaved people go there, you keep on believing that hell is hot and unsaved people go there. I don't know whether to understand here and take it. One of, one of the reasons I think, I suspect, uh, behind the fact that church attendance across the board has fallen off. You, you understand, you understand it was happening pre-COVID. COVID just highlighted it. You understand that? I, I, I won't stay here. Folks don't like it, so I won't stay here. Uh, but, but all COVID did was pull the covers off what was already in people's hearts. Uh, you see, uh, you, there, 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 there was argument back and forth over stuff uh, that may not really be terribly important. For instance, what day should you go to church? Should it be Sunday? Well, listen, if, if, if you follow Paul, uh, Paul might tell you, pick a day. But whatever day you pick, make it holy. I didn't get many amens there. Whatever day you pick, uh, there, there's a church in your home, Seven Day Adventist Church, and uh, you know, they worship on Saturdays. Uh, we we drive by there, and uh, you know they're they're in church, and uh, when we're in church, they drive by and they see us in in church. The Jews worship on uh, you know, they worship on Saturday. Uh, well, here's here's what I want to tell you, folks. We argue over stuff. We argue over things. And what if? What if it really? What if the heart of God just wants you to keep every day holy? But one of those days you need to go to church. Listen, I have no problem going to church on Sunday. It would be an adjustment to go on Saturday. It would be an adjustment to go any other day. But I worship God every day. Shout with me. Uh, anybody hear what I'm saying to you? They're arguing over. I, I don't think there's a reason to argue over that. They say, well, uh, there, there's nothing in that New Testament that says you ought to pay tithe. There is no commandment. Preacher can't tell me i got to pay tithe. I, I just tell them, don't hand me that. I said, Adam paid tithe before there was ever a law. They say that was under the law. Well, what about Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek before there was ever a law? So explain that to me. Uh, listen, if you listen to God, you may wind up paying more than 10%, not a commandment, uh, but more. God may have you to pay more than that. Folks say, well, uh, the church ain't doing nothing with the money. I I'll just give people, I I'll just help them myself. I'm yet to find one that does that. They can blame the church for doing nothing, sitting on money, banking it. Uh, you know, the preacher gets a fat salary and got a nice car and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, they, they just complain about all the church ain't doing. I'll just take my money and help the poor. I hadn't found one poor person they've helped. Everybody with me? I'm, I'm just saying, how do we get here or how we got here is because there are foes who have been marked by the first mark of the beast. It, it, didn't, it didn't start yesterday. It's been around uh, for some time. Hath God said that that's all the enemy did. It, it started in that garden and he asked Eve a question and all of a sudden now Eve acts like she's uncertain. Hath God said only question in the whole scenario. Everything thing after that is rapid fire. He said, uh, you shall not surely die. God does know your eyes will be open. You'll be as God's. You shall know good and evil. Why well, ask another question? The first one did the job. Well, it wound up making them homeless. Uh, we know from scripture when Eve was marked by that beast. We know when she was marked. Uh, we know when that, uh, that, that mark of the beast, that question mark was branded into her soul. According to verse 6, the book of Genesis, uh, there it telling that story, uh, the, 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 it happened. Uh, she was branded. She was marked when she saw the Bible says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eye, tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit. I'm 
telling you, uh, she, she was marred. She was marred uh, from the time she looked at that tree and said, you know, I wonder what that tastes like. I, you know, it, it's got to be good. Else God wouldn't have said, you can't eat of that. Anybody hear uh, what I'm saying? Uh, you know, she just looked at that. She wondered. She marveled. Uh, you know, how much wiser would I be if I could eat of that tree? Maybe maybe that serpent's right. Maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe God's keeping something back from me. Maybe I could be better, and God's not allowing that. Uh, she wasn't marked. Uh, she wasn't marked when she sinned. She was marked when she doubted. Shout with me. I said she was marred when she dealt it, when she had second thoughts about whether or not I'll drop dead if I eat that tree, whether or not something in me will die. Uh, you know, she threw caution to the wind. She Listen, she didn't die when she grabbed that fruit. She didn't die when she bit that fruit. She didn't die when she chewed up that. But when she swallowed it, when she, when she ate it, biting it ain't eating it, uh, chewing it up ain't eating it. But when she swallowed it, shout with me somebody, and she crossed the point of no return. She was marked when she doubted, but she fell into sin when she actually did the job. She ate that fruit, and, and, and then when, uh, as soon as that happened, the dog started chasing the cat, and the cat chased the rat, and the rat started hunting cheese, and the lion killed the lamb, and the adder developed an ill disposition. All because of the first mark of the beast. Good for food. Pleasant to the eye. Tree to make one wise. All of that, all of that started when he was marked by the first mark of the beast. And things have not been right since then. Things have not, they, they progressively gotten worse. Our fathers in the garden, talking of Adam and Eve, our fathers had great intelligence and they had a great propensity for learning. But they let the genie out of the bottle that day. And the world has not been the same since. Now, they, they didn't know what sin was. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is just me. I could live 10,000 lifetimes without ever knowing that. All the stuff we've seen. I could live 10,000 lifetimes without knowing that. But she was just so curious. Why is it God won't let us into this tree? She is marked. And then Adam was marked. Uh, he too fell into that sin. The serpent simply said, you'll not surely die. Reckon why it is. She set greater stock in what the serpent said than what God said. God said, you'll surely die. The serpent said, you shall not surely die. I've said this all over, all over the country. Uh, we, we raised our boys, three sons. We raised our boys. We taught them what we believe, what we feel that Bible teaches. And I tell folks, you know, we took, took us 18 years to get all that in there, boys. And somebody in 18 minutes undid it all. Shout with me. Reckon how long it took this serpent to undo everything that Eve and Adam had lived for 120 to 300 years. You watch it. You mark it down. When people start getting cool, when their testimony loses its glow, when they drag in the church instead of shouting in the church, this is a pretty clear indication that they more than likely have been marked by that first mark of the beast. When folks don't shout over things like they used to shout over, I remember a time, I remember a time you had to get to church early to get a front seat. Anybody remember that besides me? You had to get to church early. Uh, this is what they say. They say, I want to get close to the fire. Well, time passed, and then you had to get to church early to get a back seat. 
And now the same crowd that used to sit on the front and said, I want to get closer to the fire, sit on the back. And this is what they say. I can feel it just as good back here. That ain't how they used to feel. I was preaching in a revival, mentioned it last night, I think, uh, went for seven weeks, and uh, the, the, a friend of mine had gotten saved uh, in a meeting I preached before that revival started. Uh, and for six months, they didn't miss a night of church. Uh, they were bringing their family. Family was getting saved. I never saw anything like it in my life. And then that revival started. It broke out, went for seven weeks. Uh, we were praying one night uh, at the start of service, and he got there just a little late. Uh, the church was, uh, you know, was, was, was long, kind of shotgun-like, had uh, two sets of pews right and left in the center aisle. I, when we were praying, my eyes were open. I was just looking around while I'm praying. And he came in that side door at the back and came up that center aisle. Well, you know, again, he's late. The, pla the place is packed out every night for seven weeks. He walked up that center aisle. And on the right side, if you're in the pulpit, there was no room on that front pew. But he wasn't about to sit in the back. He came to the front, walked over several steps, and this is what he did. I watched him. He backed in among them brethren. He made room for himself. I'm not sitting on a back seat. Shout with me, somebody. He wanted to be, on, he, he was a front row guy for as long as I, I, I'm just saying. Uh, people that start out like that and maintain that, uh, you know that they're keeping the fire burning and the things of the Lord mean a lot to them. But when they get to the place, it doesn't matter whether they're in the front, don't matter whether they come to church. You can usually trace that back to it. It's something in their lives. They have been marked by that first mark of the beast. Well, uh, you know, somehow or other spiritually, every descendant of Adam was marked by that beast and that same mark uh, that caused the first couple their home, uh, you know, and their son's lives. And the legacy of that has gone through the ages. The question mark is simply an exclamation mark curved into a hook. I remember a time, and most of you do, when we were exclamation mark people. We came to church, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have church. I'm gonna praise God. We go have a time tonight and this week. But but like, we've lived long enough to see that a lot of church folks are question mark people. Shout well! I want to tell you something. I've been around the block a time or two, and it's tough when you start preaching to question mark people. There have been places, you know, all I had to do was just grab a hot mic. And holler, praise the Lord, everybody. I'm telling you, they jumping over the backs of pews. And uh, you, you know, you, you ain't said nothing yet. And they already shout. And you're thinking, if you slow down, I'll say it. Well, you didn't have to say it. They go shout anyway. Now, uh, you can preach the Britannica. And, and a lot of them not even go shout with you. Anybody hear what I'm telling? I can preach the good, the bad, the ugly, the sweet, the bitter. And folks are going to sit there and I'll tell you what's happened. They become question mark people. God give us a day when we become exclamation mark people. One more time. Jesus was born of a virgin. Laid in a manger. He died on a cross. He rose the third day. And you got to put a bridle around them to stop him from shouting. Well, that, that, that's, that's where it all started. Started in that garden. One serpent, one woman. This is where it's all going to end. History of man is the history of the spread and destruction of that first mark of the beast and its ensuing reign of terror. The Bible said that the sons of God went in to the daughters of men. Folks believe Nephilim are the result of that. How'd that happen? I'll tell you how that happened. The first mark of the beast. Well, there was a flood. Every human died with the exception of eight. And what animals were on that ark? How did things ever come to that? The first mark of the beast. Nimrod became a, a mighty hunter. That wasn't a compliment. 
Some believe that he hunted human beings down and tortured them, killed them, sacrificed them, whatever. How that happened? The first mark of the beast, Sodom and Gomorrah and the entire plain. How did, how did they become? Uh, you know, how is it that every woman knew her husband and her son and her nephew and her brother was a homosexual? How is that? How is it every, every daughter knew that her brother and her daddy and her grandpa was a homosexual? How did they get to that point? I'll tell you, it was the first mark of the beast. Uh, everything started with creation. Uh, you know, in more enlightened times, if you could call it enlightened times, uh, we came to a time when Dar Charles Darwin just about single-handedly convinced the world that God didn't create everything. Everything just simply evolved. Anybody hear what I'm saying to you? I, I, I submit to you, child, child of God, uh, if you can believe in it, and I know smart guys uh, that know more than I do will say uh, if you look at this animal, it evolves, it evolves, it evolves. I just want to tell you, let's go back to the start. In the, in the beginning, uh, nothing, the Bible doesn't say anything evolved. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Shout with me, somebody. Uh, it didn't evolve. God created all of that, a mind greater than ours, a, a hand stronger than ours. God created everything. And I don't care what Charles Darwin said. How is it, how is it uh, it, today we can, I'd say we listen, but let me back up. How is it men can push evolution in the schools, but you can't preach, teach creationism? How's that? How we ever get to the place that they believe there's 99 genders? That's confusing. Grew up in a house of five. Well, nobody in that house confused about what they were. My mom and sister knew what they were. And they knew what my daddy and my brother and I were. No confusion in that house. None. Everybody with me? So how we got to the place that they're, they're 99 years old. I just, you know, pulled 99. I know it's, uh, it's more than two uh, in, in the modern world, but uh, you, you go fill out an application and, and got all these choices of gender. You ever heard such confusion in all of your life? It's madness. Uh, you know, you, you identify uh, as, as a cat or a, a dog or a giraffe. That make any sense to you? How do we ever get here? I'll tell you, it's the first mark of the beast. Uh, folks are so stupid. And, and yeah, I said stupid. Uh, they're so stupid, they're using taxpayer money uh, to put litter boxes in public schools for youngins who identify as cats. Walking around like them old Barbie girls or, or uh, you know, the cartoon from many, many years ago. They got these, these cat ears and uh, one boy was even wearing a, 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 long, a long tail. Uh, you know, drugged by anybody. Hear what I'm saying? It's, it's insanity. I'll tell you how it started. It started with that first mark of the beast and the Antichrist has not even set up shop yet. Does anybody hear me? When churches start getting cool, it becomes a paradise for the agnostic and the is when the church cools down when we talk to our message when we don't challenge the culture and the chode culture begins to challenge the church there was a time when the church challenged the culture and changed the culture I was in the church been a lot of years ago now it was addressed down Sunday and everybody came to church just casually Baseball, football, hockey caps, baseball, jerseys, tennis shoes. And I still haven't seen a move of God. Just, just dressed in, I mean walked in nonchalant, dressed in every color of the rainbow and more. I'm not talking about perversion. I'm just saying that they walked in with every kind of jersey and cap and tennis shoe, all of that stuff, sweatpants, and just all of that came in. And, and, and I'm yet to witness a move of God in all of that. 
There was a time we challenged and changed the culture. I'm just about finished. I remember a time in our church, and this ain't all about yesterday, but you, can, you, can't, you can't tell the difference if you don't look back and see what was and compare it to what is. There was a time a man, young boy, could get saved on a Sunday morning and the hair halfway down his back. Don't know how he did it. But Sunday night, he'd come to church and that hair'd be gone. He'd, he'd have a, a neat haircut. That, that hair just all be gone. Now they get saved. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just judging what I see. Now they get saved. Take them three years to get rid of that ponytail down their back. Am I not telling the truth? Three years. And one story, the reason was I, I wasn't sure how I'd look without it. I didn't tell you how you'd look without it. You'd look like a man. <laughs> the job of the modern day church leader has grown exponentially more difficult because there are so many who have been marred by the first mark of the beast. Folks ask questions that all it would take is a little study. Pastor Eddie, any other pastor, wouldn't have to kill 30 minutes in that office or on that phone explaining something everybody can read and comprehend and understand. Everybody with me? The chat... Uh, Preaching in the church a lot of years ago now. Preaching in church, I got to finish this, but preaching in the church, and they were running about 500. Most of them were, were, were left to me, uh, but they, they enjoyed my preaching, so the pastor had, had me come. And, and he, there was a time he had a, he had a lady uh, minister music, and she was divorced, and, and his best friend was married, and had a lot of money. He put money in sound and cameras and that kind of stuff. Uh, but that best friend and that minister of music had an affair. A uh, pastor found it out, and so he sat the both of them down. It didn't make a spectacle of him. didn't make a public announcement. Uh, but, but there were folks that were curious. Well, you know, why is she not leading the music? Why, why is he sitting down? Uh, and when they found out, he lost 20 to 25 people because he dared to sit the both of them down because they had... Sin. 20 to 25 people. Somebody go check that sign. I thought it said assemblies of God. There was a time. There was a time we could do that and the church would say, that's the right thing to do. You didn't embarrass them. You didn't make a public spectacle of them. Uh, but, but you did. You did administer discipline. But now they'll get mad with you and walk out the door and go to a worse church. I preached long enough to quit and I'm just about to do that. Uh, but it's going to end. Listen, this is what Jesus did. After 4,000 years, he came into the world and he took that first mark to Pilate's court and Pilate asked him, what is truth? He asked the wrong question. Question should have been, who is truth? He asked that question, what is truth? And, and Herod's inquiry, you know, he questioned, he questioned Jesus with many words. Uh, but, but Jesus took that question mark, that first mark of the beast before, before Pilate. He carried it to that whipping post. He carried it along the Via Dolorosa. He carried it up Calvary's brow. And they nailed him to that cross. And then, uh, you know, this is what he said. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw uh, all men unto me. Uh, they nailed him to that cross. Uh, you know, he said this, he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them. That You know, that lets me off the hook. Uh, I don't have to prove God to anybody. 
I don't have to prove God to anybody. If you don't believe, then we can't go no farther. That's as far as things go. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out what things soever you desire when you pray. Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I I'm just telling you, Jesus hung on that cross. He took that first mark of the beast to that cross, and before he died, he said with a loud voice, It is finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Now it doesn't matter whether you're in Africa, India, China, Russia, Central South, it doesn't matter where you are. If men will believe on the name of Jesus, they can be saved. Listen. Bible said this. Bible said, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then the Bible said this. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. But, but here is where I wanted to get to. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They're tormented day and night forever. But the Bible says, they, the ones that have that mark, of the beast were thrown into that lake of fire. That second mark's only going to be around about three and a half years. The most dangerous one has been around for 6,000. Going to be more people go to hell because they were marked by that first mark of the beast than that second one. The most dangerous thing a person could do is question the authenticity, the authenticity, to question the integrity, the supremacy, the providence of God. Second guess that when you believed in it for so long. You know the problem with Demas when when Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having love this present. You know his problem. The problem was the first mark of the beast. I heard this story. Some have said it never happened, but I don't trust them. It's been said that Billy Graham said God led him to go visit Marilyn Monroe and offer her salvation, tell her about Jesus. Story goes that she said to him, I don't need your Jesus and several days or weeks later, I think it was days later, she was dead. If that story is true, if it's authentic, what happened to Marilyn Monroe, the sex symbol, the icon? She was marked by the first mark of the beast. John Lennon, he said, we're more popular than Jesus. He said, chances are rock and roll will outlive Christianity. He didn't even outlive Christianity. Died with four hollow point rounds in his back. He said he was Jesus' greatest fan. Jesus ain't looking for fans. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for people that would believe on him and serve him, people that would be changed. Chances are John Lennon has been in hell for how long? Oprah Winfrey sat in a Baptist church, heard that Baptist preacher preaching that Jesus uh, is the only way to God. She heard that for years and years and years. One day sitting in that church, he said that, and all of a sudden a light came on, and she said, that can't be right. Jesus cannot be the only way to God. What happened to Oprah? Sitting in a church, not in a nightclub, sitting in, what happened to Oprah? She was marked by the first mark of the beast, sitting under a man saying, the only way to God is Jesus. 
Sister Kirsten, if you'd come, I'll try to finish here. Voltaire. He said there wouldn't be a Bible around in a in hundred years. The story goes they turned his house into a publishing house for Bibles. What happened to Voltaire? Why, why, why did he die and go to hell? He was marked by the first mark of the beast. The cross and the blood are the cure for the first mark of the beast and the preventative for the second mark of the beast. The way some folks serve God, come to church, read, pray, live. They're going to die with two marks. That question mark that causes them to doubt everything about God. And then the next one, under the reign of the Antichrist, the most terrible time that has ever been. There's a long story. I'll make it short. Patsy Klein was in a wreck in the hospital. Assemblies of God man, pastor went to see her. Found out who she was. He may not have gone to see her. He may have just gone to see somebody else and found out she was in a room anyway. Struck up conversation. And naturally he told her about Jesus. I don't know if it's that day or another visit, but Patsy gave her life to Jesus her song there was a song I don't know if she wrote it but she sung it but anyway uh, the song became a hit right after she would given her life to the Lord talking to that sin as God passed her and that, that song went big some of the biggest names around came in and they actually met that old pastor they told Patsy that a that song was a hit. You're going to have to. You're going to have to promote it. You're going to have to go sing it. She wasn't completely healed, if I remember the story right. She told that pastor, this is my dream, you know. This is what I've been wanting. Now I'm, I'm going to chase it. I'm going to go after it. Walked away from Jesus. Became a star, closed every concert with a gospel song. One night she couldn't finish the song. She was oh, so overwrought with conviction. Jerry Lee Lewis was there, and Jerry Lee went into a room. He didn't, uh, you know, he didn't feel like he ought to say anything, but he felt like he needed to say something. He, he said, They'll laugh at me, but he told Patsy, he said, Your problem is you're under conviction. The Holy Ghost is convicting you. The way the story ends is they finish the concert, they go on to another venue, invited Jerry Lee to get on the plane with them, said somebody's not going, uh, you know, but something happened, they're not going, said you can take his seat. Jerry Lee grabbed the rung, lifted his foot on that bottom step, and something in him said, don't go. So Jerry Lee put his foot back down on the ground, turned that handle loose, and he said, I'll catch you next time, something like that. That night, Patsy Clyde and everybody on board that plane perished. When that plane went down in the storm, I believe chances are Patsy Clyde ever since that faithful day or night has been in hell. All because she was marred of the first mark of the beast. Saved with a broken leg in that hospital room, but when she heard that song, kept going big. I preached long enough to pull this to a close. I didn't expect this tonight to swing from the lights. I didn't expect us to slide up and down the Big Dipper. I never asked God, why do I need to preach this? 
at all. I don't need to preach tonight. I just, I just learned a long time ago. If I failed it, just preach it. Leave everything else with God. I have two sons who have been marked by the first mark of the beast. The oldest is a backslidden Church of God preacher. Backslidden. Middle son's having some health issues of some sort. He's been backslidden since 2004. I take no delight in telling you my sons have been marked by the first mark of the beast. Both of them backslidden away from God. Maybe you know some folks. Maybe you have family. Maybe you know church folks. One time lived this thing. They prayed matters through. They lived for God. But they're not where they were. They're not today where they were at one time. Our struggle, one of the great struggles we have is against that first mark of the beast. Absolutely. Would you stand with me all over the house? I don't talk for Jimmy, but I've had to I've had to talk to that devil. When the devil just insinuates certain things may not be so important. Maybe you've had battles like that. I didn't come to ask, I'm just telling you. There are times you just have to put your foot down and say, devil, I'm not becoming lax in what I believe. I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to drop the standard. I'm to listen, when I say, I'm talking about truth. I, that, that, you know, I, I believe in decency and all that, but the standard, I'm talking about truth. I, I'm not changing that. I'm not letting that go. I'm not, I'm not buying into a, a low-grade gospel I don't watch Christian TV. I hadn't watched Christian TV in a long, long time. Because most of the time, ain't nothing in that for me. If I can pull up a B.H. Clendenin video, if I can catch Brother Eddie Sullivan preaching at the Ainer Church of God, or Brother Corey Brown preaching here, Christian TV just doesn't do it for me. I'm not going to buy into a second-rate gospel. Would you, would you let's come tonight. See, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing, there's a movement now where Pentecostals don't believe that it's important to be filled with the Holy Ghost anymore. I believe everybody ought to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe it's, a, it's an urgency. I believe that everybody ought to be full of the Holy Ghost. Clinton and said that's how we have the mind of God in us, the mind of Christ in us, if the Holy Ghost is living in us. Would you come? Would you pray for people you know that have been marked? Maybe you suspect that they've been marked. Would you just come tonight? Let's just, let's just talk to him. Maybe, maybe you're under attack yourself. Maybe there are things the devil is saying to you like he said to Eve. But God didn't mean that. God, did, God didn't apply that to you. Would, you. would you let us just talk to him tonight? If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, would you ask him to fill you in this house tonight?